Who's ready for story time? Gentlemen, to the basement, a.k.a. a new evil lair. Hello again. In this video, I am going to detail my attempt to build the most efficient infant half-wave antenna that I can for 40, 20, 15, and 10 meter bands. As you can see here, looking at it at a very high level, there's nothing particularly unique about it. It's a pretty standard configuration that's proven over time. I was hesitant to even put an overall length in here, but people always ask for it. The reality is that if you try to copy the length exactly, it's not going to probably be right in your environment. It's not going to be tuned properly. And the same goes for the inductor there. And I don't even know how many microhenries it is. I don't care how many microhenries it is. I only care that it's the right amount of inductance to move the resonant point on 10 meters to where I want it. So if you want to just copy something and throw it in the air and say, well, if it's off some, I'll just use my tuner. Well, you might as well quit watching right now. There's uh, no point in having an in-fed half-wave antenna and then putting all the losses of a tuner in there. The whole point of the in-fed half-wave antenna is to not have to use a tuner. If you want to use a tuner, go build you a random wire antenna. This is not for you. With that, let's go forward and look at this with more detail. Uh, many of us have different ideas about what is portable. Uh, for some guys, it's saving every last gram of weight. And they're going to backpack up to a summit and set up. For myself, it just means smaller and lighter than I use at home. And I'm going to drive it down to the beach and set up. Uh, this enclosure is definitely too large for this ferrite. But there's a reason for that. The reason is I use these same enclosures for testing with some larger ferrites. And that's also the reason why the binding post is located so far towards the bottom of the enclosure because you can, as you can see with the larger one in here I wouldn't have room to get a wrench on the nut to tighten it but these larger ones are a different story for a different day uh, pretty quickly I just want to go over how I test the loss of transformers it's the same method used by Colin if you've seen his videos it's the same method used by Danny Horvat at MyAntennas.com. You build two identical transformers. You connect the secondaries together. You connect the two primaries to VNA. The signal goes out from the VNA. The first transformer transforms the impedance from 50 ohms to 2,450 ohms if it's a 49 to 1 transformer. And then the second one will transform it from... 2450 back to 50 ohms back into the VNA which can then calculate the amount of loss in dB and the signal that it receives of course this is a loss for two transformers so you cut that number in half to know what it is for each individual transformer uh, while I'm doing this I will experiment with different capacitance values looking for what capacitor gives me the lowest loss across the the bands that I'm interested in using the transformer for uh, if you're just blindly using 100 picofarad all the time you're probably getting it wrong and here is a graph on the VNA looking at the loss of a pair of transformers uh, used for this particular antenna. Uh, just 
again take those db values and cut them in half and this is the lowest loss transformer I've ever built. It's not suitable for 80 meters, but 40 to 10, it is absolutely the lowest loss transformer I've ever built. I don't do any testing looking at SWR here. I don't care what SWR is here. I'll care about that when it has an actual antenna wire on it. I don't do any kind of test where you put a resistor between the secondary and the coax shield uh, and look at SWR like that. I find that test to be completely a waste of time and meaningless. Uh, the behavior that will be seen there is not at all like what will be seen when you have an actual antenna wire on it. So don't waste your time with that. Okay, back to the transformer that I'm using here. Uh, as you can see, there's a circuit board in this enclosure. I mean, I had seen people use circuit boards in the past for mounting their ferrite, and I thought that was a good way to do it. But then right away I thought, well, why not put a couple traces on there? It's, it's a circuit board after all, and you can really clean up the wiring and it has to perform better if you do. So the primary from the transformer goes straight down into the board. The capacitor is right there. And in this case I connected the coax directly to the board because do I really need a pair of RF connectors there? I don't think I do. So why have the loss from them? And in some situations, um, you would want one. I, I can see that, but I don't want one here. And if I did want one, I can tell you this, it will never be a UHF connector. I do not use PL259 SO239 connectors on anything. They are not a 50 ohm connector, so they should never be used. Now you can use a mini UHF, those are actually 50 ohm. Um, I tend to use in connectors, they will directly replace um, UHF connectors almost always. So. Just about any piece of store-bought radio equipment I've ever had, I end up removing the existing connectors and installing in connectors. Um, you can also use SMA connectors. Why do we need to use non-50 ohm connectors from the 1920s when we can use uh, actual 50 ohm connectors from the 1940s? Another thing about in connectors is they're they're actually waterproof and UHF connectors are not. So it could save your coax over time. Uh, also looking at this transformer you can see that uh, I have done 16 turns here. It's 64 to 1. Um, and it's 22 gauge. The reason I did 64 to 1 is that, again, I'm targeting portable operations, so I expect it to be not as high in the air as I would normally have an antenna, and you usually need a higher ratio transformer uh, when you are closer to the ground. Uh, this is a 120 picofarad TDK capacitor. Uh, the coax is times microwave LMR195. I was going to buy the smaller LMR100A, but I found such a deal on this 195 I, I couldn't pass it up, and it's still pretty small and, and lightweight coax. And, appropriate for this application, I think. 
Uh, you see I use a binding post there uh, to connect the antenna wire. And this is a nickel-plated brass binding post, which has got to be a better conductor than using stainless steel hardware to make that connection. Also, the nut on it's captive, so you back it all the way off, it can't fall off in the grass where you have to, to look for it. Uh, with wing nuts on regular hardware store hardware, I bet we've all been there dropping them. Rather than use the uh, crimp type ring terminal to go on the uh, binding post to attach the wire, that, that's what you usually see. Uh, I use these flat ground lug terminals. You can just solder them so much easier. Um, I buy them in quantity from an eBay seller. Uh, the binding post is a quarter inch, so the M6 size is appropriate to fit that. And before I forget, this particular ferrite is ferrite brand. Part number 26611021002, which I had discussed in a previous video, uh, if you watched that one. Uh, here on the outside, I'm just using cheap 18 gauge wire from Amazon. Um, you know, I'm always testing and modifying stuff and most all my wire ends up going to waste. Uh, if I was really building something permanent, I would get some of the the good antenna wire that is available out there that's, you know, copper-coated steel and, and won't stretch. But uh, for just doing the testing, this is fine and inexpensive. Uh, anyway, I, I tin the end of the wire so I can put it through the hole in the binding post and tighten down the thumb screw. And then I like to use these flanged enclosures because you've already got two holes on each end. I don't have to install an eye bolt or anything. And I just snap a carabiner through one of the holes. And then on my wire, I have a thimble to protect the wire from the carabiner chafing it and clamp it with a cable clamp. And this is the inductor that is two meters away from the transformer. Um, it's just the antenna wire looped around a 28 millimeter diameter piece of PVC. And for the antenna tuning, which I desired, it required nine turns. I think that's pretty high. This, this wire seems to have pretty thick insulation. So that's going to mean less inductance per turn and, and why it took that many turns. Okay, let's talk about choking. So I did want a choke on this. It needs to be two meters away from the transformer. Um, I didn't want a bulky guanella type with the coax wrapped around a toroid a bunch of turns. Uh, so that meant do a Maxwell choke. And as you can see, I've got 20 suppression cores on the coax here. I separated them into four groups of five so that the coax would would still roll up and just use a zip tie on each end to uh, you know keep them from moving around um, another good reason to use this type of choke is I eliminated two more pairs of RF connectors which means I eliminated loss and that's what we're after here those 20 suppression cores are ferrite part number 26, 
zero two. And here I have used heat shrink tubing over them and the zip ties. The uh, the suppression cores are only twelve point three millimeter diameter, so they're pretty small. And half inch shrink tubing fits right over them and shrinks nicely. So how did I know to use that for choking? Well, I measured it on the VNA. So down on 40 meters, there's about 2800 ohms of impedance and it tapers up to about 5700 on 10 meters and the important thing is that it's resistive all the way so should be effective choking so after getting the overall length of the antenna tuned the inductor tuned the way I want them uh, this is what it looks like on the antenna analyzer. Now, as far as transformer ratios go, usually if you have a higher ratio, um, it will favor the lower bands more, and a lower ratio will favor the upper bands more. In this particular case, uh, the way this antenna is installed, definitely seems that 64 to 1 was the right choice. Since the best SW, SWR is 117 on 40 meters and 118 on 10 meters, it uh, doesn't really get any better balance than that, does it? Uh, now, there's two things that immediately jumped out at me when this analyzer printed this graph. And these two things show me that this antenna system is quite efficient. Here's the first one, circled. The part of the graph that nobody seems to ever want to look at. Look at how all of the peaks between the harmonics are up there over 7 to 1 SWR. That tells us that it's efficient, that it's low loss. You will see a lot of antenna analyzer graphs from these multiband antennas where between the harmonics the SWR might only go up to two or three. And that's an indicator that they have a loss problem. They definitely have a loss problem. And they've got an antenna that's one step better than a dummy load. Now, of course, if you tell them that, they'll make comments, but I make all these contacts. Well, well yeah, people have used light bulbs uh, for antennas and made contacts. Making some contacts does not equal a good antenna. You can make contacts, or you can have a much better antenna and more easily make more contacts. And here's the second indicator of efficiency. And unfortunately, um, this is not a great thing. And that's that the antenna is very narrow banded, uh, still wide enough to. Um, completely cover three of the four bands, but of course, you know, no no antenna covers all of 10 meters, but um, this one is especially narrow. And we can see that better zooming in here on 10 meters uh, with the way I currently have it tuned to cover as much of the band as possible, starting at the bottom, at about 28, 640 it's done. That's all you get. So the tuning is that much more critical. And as you can see here on the green trace, I lengthened 
the antenna 12 centimeters because I only do CW and digital. I don't care about phone at all. And yes, I lose some bandwidth, but the part of the band that I actually use is better tuned for my purposes. Now, if I was doing single sideband, what I probably would do here instead is take at least one turn off of the inductor, and that's going to shift 10 meters upward. Going to just slightly shift 15 meters upward and make the upper part of that band a little better, uh, but it's not going to be a huge change. It's not going to affect 40 and 20. But uh, you, you could definitely move this upward uh, for sideband, get 10 meters where you want it, and make 15 meters a little better um, just by using a little less inductance. Or, like I'm doing, you can just lengthen it a little bit and uh, improve it for CW and digital. All right, let's move on to testing the reception of this antenna. This is my favorite radio, the Hermes Light 2. It's just a 5-watt software-defined radio that uh, does some interesting things. And it's not for everybody. For one thing, there's obviously there's no knobs, no buttons, no switches, and some people just won't use a radio like that. I actually prefer it. Uh, also, it's uh, it's an open source project, so there's no you know company that's uh, going to be giving you any support. Uh, any support that there is is just volunteers on a Google group. But an interesting thing that this radio will do is even with the standard transmit receive gateway loaded in it. Uh, it can receive four slices of spectrum at once, which you could have on four different bands. Actually, in just a few seconds, you can load a receive-only gateway in it to where it can do ten receivers. And I've done that in the past and, you know, uh, done digital decodes on every band from 160 to to 10 meters all at the same time but in this case we don't need to do that because we only need four receivers anyway so the standard gateway is fine there's multiple software packages that uh, will work with this radio uh, in this particular case I'm going to be using the incredible spark SDR and you can see up at the top I have 24 virtual receivers running. So what I'm doing here is I'm decoding Whisper, FT8, FT4, JS8, JT9, and PSK31 all at the same time on all four bands at the same time. Then all of my decodes are uploaded to PSK Reporter automatically by the Spark SDR software. So all I need to do is go to the PSK Reporter website and look at the maps and I can see who I've been receiving. These maps are all set for a 24-hour period, which is the most you can do on there. So, here's 40 meters. I think it looks pretty good. Now, it's Africa's pretty quiet and usually seems to be. I have almost never made QSOs in the Middle East. Very few. Never have in India and I never have in Southeast Asia at all other than I do have a lot in Indonesia 
and so this map is um, very much like what I've seen in the past. I think 20 meters is looking very good. And I think 15 meters is looking very good also. And 10 meters looks good. There's a nice surprise there that I actually decoded the German station in Antarctica. Uh, usually anytime I do whisper transmission testing, uh, they hear me. Of course, it's very radio silent down there. I think they hear everybody. But I have never heard them before, and I sure didn't expect that to happen on 10 meters. For transmission testing, I like to use this Zactec whisper transmitter that will fit in your pocket. Uh, you initially configure it by just connecting it to uh, your PC with USB. There's a little application where you put your call sign and you tell it which bands you want it to cycle through and save it and then that's all and then to actually use it there's no computer needed at all uh, it's uh, GPS disciplined so it will keep very accurate time you put the GPS antenna there on it uh, of course you connect it uh, to your HF antenna and the USB port is used to power it at that time and that could be uh, just a phone charger or one of those uh, lithium packs that's got USB ports. Uh, this thing doesn't uh, need much power. It uh, it only transmits um, at 200 milliwatts. So let's see how well people can hear this. Well, on 40 meters, it looks great. Let's not lose sight of. You know, this is only 200 milliwatts minus however much of that is lost going up the coax and through the transformer before it actually gets on the antenna wire to radiate. The um, aforementioned uh, German research station, Antarctica, as always, they are hearing me. Um, the station way up in none of it. I have not seen before. And this is not the only band it shows up on. 20 meters looks good. I'd like to see more into Japan, but I can't control the propagation on a particular day, of course. Uh, the one uh, way up north there by Svalbard, that's a German uh, ship. I'm also happy with 15 meters, and there's that uh, station way up in Nunavut again. 10 meters, um, pretty good to uh, Australia, New Zealand, I guess. Yeah, I look at this map and I'm disappointed about Europe and Japan, and I have to keep reminding myself, hey dummy, you're not even putting 200 milliwatts out there. What do you expect? Miracles? And that is going to complete this video. Full details of this project are published on GitHub. The link will be in the description of this video. So if you want any of these circuit boards, you can get the Gerber files there, upload them to a board house and get boards made. Uh, and I also list all the parts that I've used in this build. If I left any details out, please let me know, and I will correct that. I want this fully documented. And now I'm issuing an open challenge to the Facebook group experts. Build one that works better than this one. Document it in full, as I have. If you can do that, that will only benefit everyone, right?
So instead of talking, instead of doing theoretical calculations in things like SimSmith, make something real. Show us how good it is. Show us it's the best there is. Because that's what you tend to claim about what you do. Let's see it. Back it up. And as always, you should treat me just like the Facebook group experts. You shouldn't believe anything I've had to say in this video. Instead, you should get your own test equipment, do your own testing, get your own results. And then you'll know how good your stuff really is. Thanks for watching.